And the Bible tells us that Jesus is so concerned, not so much about all these outward actions that everybody else sees in our lives, although that's important, but what Jesus is concerned about, about your life and my life, is he, he's concerned about our heart, about what's on the inside. So how many of you guys like home projects? Raise your hand if you like home projects. How many of you do not like home projects? Okay. How many of you guys are terrible at home projects? Like, that's why you don't like them. Okay, so I, you know, I want to tell you a story. And sometimes I share the names of people, and sometimes I don't, you know. And just depends. But I'm not going to share the name of this person because it doesn't matter. But I want to tell a story about somebody who um, had a home project. And um, his wife said, hey, can you put up some shelves in our laundry room? Sounds like a good request, right? And, and, I, and again, I identify with this, this story because I don't, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not handy. I mean, I'll sit with you, I'll cry with you, I'll celebrate with you. But don't ask me to fix anything because I don't know the difference between a two-by-four and a four-by-four. But, you know, I, it's just I don't. So, you know... Um, so this guy, his wife said, can you put up some shelves in our laundry room? She's like, he's like, sure. So he puts up the shelves, and he, and he puts them up, and, and he nails them in, and everything in life was good. And, you know, he, he liked, liked his job that he did. And um, a couple weeks later, he's looking in the laundry room, and he noticed that there was a spot on the wall. And he's like, that's weird. You know, it was kind of a big, round, yellow spot, or actually it was orange, he said. And like that's weird and he's like I wonder how I missed that spot and so he did what you know any good person would do he got out his paint right and his brush and he just said I'm gonna just paint over the spot and that's what I would do and so, so he did and so um, life is good well about two weeks later not exaggeration the spot appeared again and he's like what the heck he thought to himself Huh, I must have bad paint. <laughs> that sounds rational to me. I mean, that's what I would think too. You know, if I paint and there's a spot, I must have bad paint. And so he painted it again, got a different can of paint, and painted it again. And um, you guys probably know where I'm going with this. About two weeks later, the same spot appears. So this is the third time this spot appears. And it was at that point in time he thought to himself, you know what, I think there's a bigger problem here. I think there is a deeper issue here that's going on. And sure enough, he, you know, did the hard work and he tore out the drywall. And he had found that when he put the shelves up, there was the bathroom up, was up above. And he had pierced the drain coming from the bathroom down. And it was leaking into his wall this whole time over the course of a month. Now, here's the crazy thing. He said, true story, that he did not have the time to fix it right then. And so he waited another month before he could actually fix it. <laughs> that is, you know. And, and I just, I'm like, I get it. You know, I get that. I get that story because um, I feel like that a lot of times in life. Like, you know, um, I think a lot of us are kind of like that. We um, see spots, things that appear in our lives, and we rationalize, we excuse. We look for all kinds of reasons why something is happening, something is coming out from the inside of our lives. And we're like, okay, well, you know, you know we have excuses, we have rationalization, so why this spot is appearing in our lives? And rather than looking below the surface of our lives as why this is happening, we're like, I'm just going to do what? I'm just going to paint over it. As long as nobody else sees, that's all that really matters. And so we don't do the hard work. We don't take the time. It's like, I don't, like, how many of us have the time to really tear open our heart and our lives and say, what's really on the inside here? Like, who wants to do that anyways, right? Nobody wants to do that. And so, like my friend, we would just rather take paint. And we would just rather paint over that spot so that nobody else sees it and say, you know what? 
I'm going to rationalize, whatever, excuse why this is happening, and I'll just deal with it later, or I won't deal with it at all. As long as I can keep hanging over it, I'm just not going to deal with it. And that's like a lot of our lives, about things that are going on in our lives and stuff that, that's percolating below the surface of our life, and we just don't want to look inside. Um, and the Bible tells us that Jesus is so concerned, not so much about all these outward actions that everybody else sees in our lives, although that's important, but what Jesus is concerned about, about your life and my life, is he, he's concerned about our heart, about what's on the inside, about our desires. He's concerned about our thoughts. He's concerned about our emotions, the motivation of our heart. What's on the inside? You know, back in 1966, the year before I was born, I don't remember this, but I do remember the song. Rolling Stones came out with a song, and it became number one for a multiple number of weeks. And um, Rolling Stone magazine gave the top 500 songs all time, right? And it came in at number 213 all time of all the songs, you know, in the last whatever, 50 years that have been recorded. It came in at number 213 came out in 1966, and it remained number one for a long time. Where's Jack? Jack, what is the song? No, that was close. <laughs> That's close, Jack. That's good. That, no, it wasn't that. It was the song Paint It Black. Paint It Black. Right? And I think we've got the, uh, yeah, and, and this is how part of, the, part of the whatever song goes. And you probably, those of you who are older who know the song, it's playing in your head right now, that weird Turkish instrument. I don't know what they call it. It's playing in the background. And Mick Jagger's singing, and he's saying, you know, I look inside myself and see my heart is black. I see my red door. I must have it painted black. Maybe then I'll fade away and not have to face the facts. It's not easy facing up when your whole world is black. Mick Jagger's talking about the darkness that he saw that he knew was in his own life. Now, this song in particular is talking about grief, and it's talking about depression and suffering, right? But he's like, oh, I look inside my life, and I see I have this black heart. And I think a lot of us can identify with it, because when we look into our lives, we don't want everybody else to see this, but we know we've got anger issues. We know we've got... Um, uh, We've got um, addictions in our lives. We know that we've got bitterness in our heart and unforgiveness in our heart. We know that we have this critical spirit. Like in these, we have these things behind the scenes when no one else is watching. And we know all of a sudden, all of a sudden it seeps out in the middle of a situation. Like, oh, well, let, me just, let me just get that real quick. Let me get that paintbrush out. And I just don't want anybody to see this. I'll just paint over. I'm not going to deal with my heart. We have this, this judgmental attitude towards other people. And rather than dealing with our heart, like, well, let me, just, let me just focus on my actions instead of my heart that I have here. I think, again, it speaks to people because we can identify and recognize that I have issues. Again, whether it's anger, stress, addiction, lust, lack of self-control, bitterness, jealousy, resentment, unforgiveness. Sin that's hidden in my life that no one else sees. Or maybe it's even sin that I'm aware of. I'm just not dealing with. I'd rather just paint it over. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, he says, oh, guys, I'm so concerned about your heart. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. And that word heart, oftentimes, sometimes the Bible would say it would refer to your soul or it would refer to your, your mind or your will or your emotions, the things I think about. Blessed are those who have pure thoughts and their, their emotions or uh, their desires, their desire to, their will to um, follow Jesus Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. Old Testament passage is not on the screen, but it says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God sees. He sees and he knows our heart, what's behind the scenes, and he is really concerned about your heart this morning. Your thoughts and your desires and your emotions. 
we think, well, you know, let me just, let me just focus on my actions. And she's like, no, I want to start with your heart. Do you ever notice in the Bible that Jesus says some really stern things to people? But it's not the people who are outwardly like, you know, it's not the people who are, who are sinning and they know they're sinning. Everybody else knows they're sinning. Like, he's, he's not hard on the tax collectors who are cheating everybody. He's not hard on the people who are living, the, um, like a prostitute who's living in sexual promiscuity. He's hard on the religious people who are pretending to be something on the outside when internally there's something totally different on the inside. It's the religious people who are always just focused on putting this burden on everybody, wanting you to change your actions and never being concerned about your heart. Those are the people that he's hard on. Listen to what he says, Matthew chapter 23. These people who pretend like they have it all together. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, you people who act like you have it all together, you Pharisees. Those are the religious leaders. He said, you guys are hypocrites. You're inconsistent on the outside with on the inside. You are so careful to clean the outside of your life, the outside of the cup and the outside of the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish. Then the outside will become clean too. He's talking about this transformation that takes place when God deals with our thoughts and our desires and our emotions. And then we ultimately see the, our actions take place. But so many Christians, these religious leaders, they want to focus on our actions and not worry about. They're like, well, if you know, it just looks good on the outside. I don't have to worry about my thoughts and my emotions and my desires. And Jesus is like, that just leads to legalism. When all you're doing is trying to have behavior modification and not really transformation of your heart. And it's just legalism. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees. The message, which is more of a paraphrase, it's not really a translation of the Bible. It's a paraphrase of the Bible. And it's kind of contemporary. And I think that is the guy who paraphrased his name is Eugene Peterson. And I think he did a good job paraphrasing this passage. He says this. Okay, he's paraphrasing that same passage with the words of Jesus. Hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's, with people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy, lawlessness, rebellion. You're hopeless. You religion scholars and Pharisees, you're frauds. You're like manicured grave plots, grass clipped and the flowers bright. But six feet down under, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and they think you're saints, but beneath the skin, wow, you're total frauds. It's like, oh, we'll just change everything on the outside, but I'm not going to worry about my thoughts, my desires, my emotions. I'm not going to worry about a heart change. Probably everybody in, in this room um, at one point or another has um, got an oil change, right? And, you know, I already told you I'm not handy, so I've never changed my oil. Don't judge me because <laughs> that's coming from a bad heart. <laughs> I, just, I, I just never have done it. So, but I did change my battery last week. I was proud of myself for doing that. So, <clears throat> anyways, never changed my oil. And, you know, um, if you get your oil change, right, but if you don't change your filter, right, what happens? Now, I confirmed this with Roger this morning, who's a mechanic, because I really didn't know. <clears throat> so, but if you don't change your filter and you just change the oil and you just keep on changing your oil but you never change your filter, ultimately what's going to happen is the whole engine is going to fail because the filter has never been changed. And all you've done is change the oil the whole time. You've never changed the filter in your car. This filters out all that stuff. And this is kind of like your heart. Like, oh, I'm just going to worry about changing all these outward actions of my life, but I'm never worrying about my heart change, the transformation of my heart, my thoughts, my will, my desires, my emotions. And ultimately, she's like, you got, it's just a bunch of legalism. It's going to lead to engine failure if you don't have a pure heart. 
Sometimes people go through difficult times. And people in the world, non-Christians, will say, oh, you know what? If you're going through a difficult time, just change your circumstance. You have a horrible marriage? Just change your marriage. Just change, you know, get married to somebody else. You don't like where you live and it's a difficult time? Just change your circumstances and move someplace else. It's all about our circumstances. Religious people who aren't following Jesus, they would say, oh, you know, go through a difficult time, you're miserable, just change your actions. It's all about what you do. Jesus say, no, it's about your heart. I want to see a heart change in your life. You've got heart issues. It doesn't mean all of your problems are going to go away. But Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will do what? They will see God. Isn't that amazing? Well, oftentimes we, we quote that passage and say, blessed are the pure in heart. And we're going to talk about, okay, well, how do you have a pure heart? But it says, the pure in heart will see God. Not, most theologians say, oh, you know, he's probably talking about heaven. That's true when Jesus says the pure in heart will see God in heaven. But they won't just see God in heaven. The pure in heart are going to see God even right here, right now. It's like, oh, I'm in the middle of this crisis in my life. And because I have a pure heart, I'm going to find God and see God in the middle of the mess of my life. I'm going to see God working and moving in the middle of my life because I have a pure heart. Isn't it crazy how two people can go through very similar experiences in life? And one's like, I don't know where God was. I didn't see God. I don't know God. I don't know where God is in my life. Some of you are probably feeling super distant from God right now. You don't see God anywhere. There's other people like, I, I see God everywhere. Like, I see dead people. Like, I see God everywhere. <laughs> and it kind of goes back to like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe I need a heart check. Right? Because that's our desires. I want to see you, God. I want to experience you. I'm going to know you. I'm going to walk with you, God. And so may, maybe I'm not seeing you because there's a heart problem in my life right now. I've just been painting over stuff. I haven't been willing to do the hard work, tear out the drywall, and you know, let you kind of get in there and examine things. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, verse 14 and, and verse 15. Mark 7, Jesus called the crowds to come and to hear, to listen. All of you listen, Jesus said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes from, from where? From your heart. Those thoughts, those desires, those emotions. It's like, oh, it's not what comes in. You know, you be around people all the time that are doing all kinds of crazy things and all kinds of sinful things. Jesus is like, no, it's what comes out of your heart is what defiles you. Jesus ate with people who were sinners all the time, frequently. Religious people are like, oh, no, no, you can't eat with people. You know, we all probably work with people who don't, are not following Jesus. And Jesus is like, that's not what defiles you just because you're around the people who don't know me. Religious people are like, oh, let's not be around people like that. Let's just go get in our holy little huddle here. She's like, well, that's not, that's not the problem being around people who don't love me. It's your heart problem. Another kind of a paraphrase, this is the amplified, uh, which again is more of a paraphrase, helps us understand the passage a little bit. It puts it like this. After Jesus called the people to himself again, he began saying to them, listen carefully to me, all of you. Hear and understand what I'm saying. There's nothing outside of a man such as food, which, going, which by going into him can defile him morally or spiritually. But the things that come out of the heart of a man are what defile and dishonor him. Again, Jesus is like, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. They will experience him, the pure in heart. You know, you don't have to go somewhere to see God move. You have to be somebody. You know, back in the day, Christians used to run all over. He's like, oh, I, you know, I want to go over here to experience God. And then people would chase and experience and think God is over here, God is over here. And so I have to go someplace to see God. No, God's like, no, you don't have to go someplace. You have to be somebody to see me. It's not about going someplace else. You have to be somebody. It's about the purity of your heart. Jesus says you'll see 
God, when, you, when that's going on in your life? How can I have a pure heart? So if it's so important and Jesus is concerned about it, and that's how we're going to see and experience God working and moving in our lives and all of our circumstances and situations, well, you should, ask myself, you should ask yourself the question, well, how can I have a pure heart then? If it's so important, Pastor Brad. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 22. You might be a little disappointed, but this is what, this is super simple, Jesus says. If you want to have a pure heart, it says you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind. And he says you must love your neighbor as yourself. It's like, oh, a pure heart comes from my desires and from my, my desire to follow you, Jesus. And I want to love you with all of my heart. And so I'm asking myself that question when I see myself reacting and responding in certain situations. And when I see stuff going on, I'm saying, God, am I loving you right now with all of my heart? All my thoughts, all my desires, all of my emotions. In this situation, I want to have a pure heart. God, am I loving you right now? And God, am I loving other people? Is this loving towards somebody else? God, is this loving towards you? God, is this loving towards somebody else? I mean, imagine how much our lives would change if we just asked ourselves those simple questions. Because we want to have a pure heart. I think the second thing here is James chapter 4, verse 7. James, the brother of Jesus, says this. That we are to come close to God. Other translations say draw close to God and God will come close or God will draw close to you. Like pursue God. You know, I used to tell people, I, I say this sometimes not as often, but if, you know, there's this phrase that I learned probably 30 years ago. And it just, I felt it's like so, so true. And it's the phrase, if I'm not actively pursuing Christ, I'm passively resisting him. It's like, oh, I want to have a pure heart. If I'm not actively pursuing Christ, not just sitting on the sidelines, but if I'm not actively pursuing him, right, with my heart, if I'm not actively pursuing him, I'm passively just sitting back and resisting him. James says, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. God, I, I want to be completely, I want to have a pure heart. I want to be completely devoted to you. Jesus, I want to live for you. I want to have a purity in my purposes for you, Jesus. I want to live for you alone. I want to have a pure heart. Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. David wrote this psalm, and David, I'll talk, his life was a disaster, a lot of his life. He was this king, and um, the Bible says that David had a heart after God. And I, and I always would think, man, God, why would you say that about this dude who had affairs or had an affair, murdered somebody, and was a horrible dad much of his life? Like his family was a mess. And yet this guy had a heart after you, God? I wonder about that. And I don't think... It was necessarily talking about um, David was just this incredible man. It was like God, God chose to use David for his purposes. He had a heart after God. God chose to use him for his purposes in spite of all this junk in his life. It says that he was close to God. And there's a couple of things I noticed about his life. And he says this in Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. He says, be angry and do not sin Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. It's like David's like, oh, when you go to bed at night, I want you to ponder in your heart. Another translation, the message again, Eugene Peterson puts it like this. Complain if you must, but don't lash out. Keep your mouth shut and let your heart do the talking. Build your case before God and wait for his verdict. In other words, David's saying, you know what, you want to have a pure heart. It's about loving God and loving other people. You want to have a pure heart. It's about spending time with God. It's like, oh, God, I, knew, I want to spend time with you. you. We all know that the more time you spend with somebody else, the more you do what? Become like that other person, right? I used to joke, we used to have a couple here. Their names were Howard and Geneva, and they passed away over these last couple of years, but they were married for like 65 years or something. And I tell you what, they were like Twinkies, like they dressed alike, they talked alike, they smelled alike. I mean, everything. It's like they were just alike because they had been married for so long. 
It's like, oh, I want to have a pure heart, God. David's like, well, spend time with the Lord. You know, when no one's looking, when no one's around, ask God to reveal things, to peel back that drywall, to pull it off. And Psalm 139, again, David's praying, and this is a great prayer. David says, God, this is my prayer. Search me and know my heart. God, I know you know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thought. God, point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. God, would you show me areas of my life where I'm offending you and I'm walking astray and I'm doing things out of impure motives or desires. God, would you show me those areas of my life? And then David says this in Psalm 51, and it's kind of a long passage here, but David says, um, God, would you, would you have mercy on me? Because if he, now David has just been confronted about his adultery. And this is his response. He says, God, have mercy on me because of your unfeeling love. God, all of a sudden I see this darkness in my heart. Would you, God, because of your compassion, would you blot out the stain of my sin? Would you wash me clean? God, this is only something, only you can give me a pure heart. Would you wash me clean from my guilt? Would you purify me from my sin? God, only you can do this. I recognize my rebellion. Like, oh, I'm, I'm going to stop excusing it. I'm going to stop blaming it on other people. God, I recognize this is coming from a bad spot in my heart. It's, I'm being rebellious. It haunts me day and night, King David said. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. He says, God, create in me. This is something only you can do. God, create me a clean heart, God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. God, don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. This is his prayer. He says, God, would you do this work in my life? One last passage of Scripture. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 10. Again, this is part of this, God, would you create in me this heart that's pure? First John 1 says, if we claim we have no sin, like this message applies to all of us because we all have things in our lives that God is dealing with us on because of our fallenness, our brokenness. If we claim, well, I, have this, I don't need this message, I have no sin in my life, we're only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth, but if I confess my sin, I acknowledge it like, God, this is why I'm spending time with you. I want to be aware of this. And God, would you come in? Would you, I'm repenting, I'm acknowledging this, I'm confessing this to you, and I'm going to turn and walk another way. If we confess our sins to Him, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar. And showing that his word has no place in our hearts. It's like, oh God, I know you're really concerned about, more than anything, you're concerned about my heart. And so this morning, I'm tearing off that drywall. It's like, God, would you reveal to me the darkness in my own heart, my own life, where I've wandered away from you? 